Congratulations, Tom. Uh, and uh, thank you to everybody here. I see we have a full house. Thank you to Brookings and uh, to our panelists. We have Bob Kagan and Ambassador Gerardo Rowe and a lot to talk about. So I was struck, as I'm sure a lot of people here were, that you very deftly, you mentioned tweeting, but more or less you managed to get through you know, a really brilliant 20-minute conversation and not really deal so much with, with our present challenges, as it were, you know, but really, I, I just, I have to say, like, it's an incredible feat in this, you know, sort of every 10 seconds, there's something new happening <coughs> age, to be able to sustain a conversation about what it, the world looks like 10 or 20 years down the road. Uh, so I thought I would start out both with a question for you, Tom, and also uh, for the other panelists to bring them in. Uh, I did a conversation with, with our maximum leader, Strobe Talbot, for the podcast this week, and he quoted uh, a recent visit from a high-level uh, Asian diplomat here to Brookings. And he said that this uh, gentleman basically said, look, you know, I'm sorry to say it, but right now, Washington, D.C. is the epicenter of global instability. And, you know, it's a blunt statement. So first of all, I guess I'd like to, to see what everybody thinks about that statement, whether it's really true. And also, just to, to, to challenge you a little bit, how does, if, if you accept that or don't accept that, how does this moment that we're experiencing of uh, political change here, uh, uncertainty around American foreign policy, affect or not affect the broader, longer-term trends that you identify toward uh, a much more, uh, a world of much more competition, uh, a world of much more overall uncertainty. So <coughs> let's jump in with that. Are we living in the epicenter of global political instability right here? Brookings, Massachusetts <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> uh, firstly, thank you. And, uh, you know, I finished the book sort of just before November 8th, and I had a deal with the <laughs> publisher that I could rewrite parts of it uh, if the election turned out in a certain way, but no one really expected that, so they had their plan. <laughs> and afterwards, you know, I, I, I took a look at it and was like, you know, what do I do? I need to change all of this or not? And what I, I thought I would have to change more because what I realized was that the essential argument is a, of the book is that the U.S. Is, the world is becoming more nationalistic, more competitive, more zero sum. And I assumed, I guess, before the election, that the U.S. would be pushing back against that, that the mm -hmm. U.S. would be trying to uphold this. Order. And I didn't really understand the extent to which it could be consumed by that or actually would be enveloped by some of those forces. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote, I was always going to write the conclusion and, and, the, ep, and the prologue be after uh, the election, so I tried to address it there. But I think in some ways it shows that those forces are even stronger, you know, than, the, than I originally anticipated. And since the U.S. is so crucial, I think, in upholding the order and the role it's played, the very unusual role that Bob has, has written so eloquently about over the last 70 years. I do agree, I guess, with our Asian diplomatic friend that, that the instability is emanating from here. I mean, it's amazing that in the first few months of this administration that there's been no real external crises with the exception of a small, I think relatively small crisis in, in, in Syria and an ongoing problem in North Korea, but there's been nothing external. It's all been internally generated. And, and the world is sort of watching very closely every day to see what comes out on Twitter or, or, or elsewhere. So I think that will continue for some time. But the big question I'm trying to figure out is, will there be an external event and how that will interact with this internal instability? So, Bob, are we at the epicenter here? Well, sure. And, and for all the t reasons that, that Tom outlines, the only thing I would say, and I mean, Trump is a unique person and he's a unique president, but he... On foreign policy, he's not as unique as we might like to believe. I think that the trend in the United States for some time uh, since the end of the Cold War has been toward less and less tolerance for the incredible, the rather unusual global role that the United States played after World War II and throughout the Cold War. Um, I think you know you could have you could see it at the end of the first Bush administration in 92, when he sort of had to run away from foreign policy. Bill Clinton said he was gonna focus on the economy. George W. Bush said that America was overextended in the world, um, uh, ironically in retrospect. But this has been the trend. 
And I would say that the culmination of that trend was not Trump, but the Obama administration, where I think that uh, President Obama, because of Iraq and Afghanistan and the financial crisis, uh, felt that he'd been elected to reduce America's role in the world and that he was going to do that. And he didn't, he really, I think, was very faithful to that, to that mission. And uh, Trump is sort of just the sort of crasser, uh, nastier version uh, of where we've been heading uh, for some time. And I think the consensus that existed during the Cold War has broken down. And if, just as a last comment, if you look at the last election, the, the four most significant characters in American politics last year were Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, and Bernie Sanders. Three of those, I think, agreed that America was too involved in the world. Um, only one of those was selling indispensable nation. I would say selling it sotto voce because it wasn't particularly a popular uh, view to take. So I think we're dealing with something much more like a secular problem than a particular Donald Trump problem. The particular Donald Trump problems exist in other areas which uh, we're not talking about today. What do you think? Uh, first, uh, thank you very much. Now, first, a disclaimer. I'm not expressing the, the position of my country. I'm here as a professional diplomat discussing the, uh, this, this book. And, uh, and I do agree with, you know, Willie, with, with just what has been said. Uh, you are a bit too much <coughs> obsessed right now about what is happening within the Beltway. So by, you know, I beg you for, for once to try to have a long-term vision. You know, let's, let's forget for the tweets, let's forget, you know, the front pages of the newspapers, and, and let's, let's look, have a look at what is happening uh, in the world. You know, really, and in a sense, what is happening in Washington right now is not that important. I'm really sorry to, di to disturb you. You know, really, it's, uh, <laughs> we, are living in a, we are living right now, we are living something uh, which is uh, exceptional. Uh, and, and I think the quality of the book of Tom is trying to face it frankly. You know, it's... Uh, First, uh, when people speak about liberal world order, I think, frankly, it's a nice way of saying American world order or Western world order, if you want. You know, I was the permanent representative to the United Nations, and I can tell you that people there, you know, the representatives of the 192 countries or 191 uh, countries there, you know, didn't see it as the liberal order, most of them, but as an American-dominated order. Uh, and, and the question that we can raise, and actually we can ask Tom, is really, do you think that it's coming back, the, the, uh, the great power uh, really competition is coming back, or maybe it has always been there? You know, really, basically, we had the Cold War, where we had, obviously, Soviet Union and the U.S. dominating their own camp, and we've really, after that, you had, as you said, this unipolar moment when the Americans were so powerful that nobody felt, no country felt powerful enough, really, in a sense, to compete against the U.S. And basically what we are seeing now is simply that countries feel they have the means to balance against the U.S. So in a sense, is it really a new period or is it simply the fact that the balance of power between all the countries has changed and that suddenly the U.S. and, let's say it, the Western countries with the U.S., suddenly we feel that our hegemony, you know, is basically is contested by, by other countries. Well, this is a good question for Tom to answer. And also, I'd like to ask Bob sort of a corollary to this, which is, do, can you ever think of any example where it's not so much that the United States has lost power as much as arguably it's walked away from playing this role in the world. President, this thing, yeah. <laughs> President Macron, <laughs> what do you think? It's being webcast, so it's... Uh, actually, it's a minister. <laughs> Put him on speaker. <laughs> uh, but I want to ask you, uh, before we go back to them, is, is, is France, is, is Europe prepared to step in and to play the role that the United States has been playing on European defense, for example? We may uh, criticize President Trump's it's, sort of manner of delivery, but there is a critique which would suggest that the United States has played the role of hegemon in Europe because Europeans have been unwilling or unable to do so. 
That's a very American question. <laughs> uh, Forgive me. You know, actually, <laughs> if we are obliged to do it, we right. will do it. Yeah. You know, we have been around for 1,000 years, so we know what the world is. <laughs> so if we feel that we need, actually, as you say, to step in. We have not the impression that we have stepped out, but if you think, we will, we will do it. You know, really, we have defended ourselves for really for the worst and, and for the best for 1,000 years. So, again, you know, the fact is, uh, if the U.S. has uh, really been so active in, in Western Europe since 1945, I think it's very important to, to notice that till 1945, the U.S. didn't want to have an European policy. You know, really, in 1914, in 1939, you declared your neutrality in 1937, you voted law of neutrality, the object of which was to deprive the French and the British from buying your weapons. I, I do remember. On the 14th of June, 1940, the Prime Minister of France sent a letter to, to, John, uh, to, to FDR to say, we are sinking, we are defeated, we are the democracies, please help us. So you decided not to come. You went in 1945, why? Because really, why? Because Britain, and France couldn't do the job because we were win exhausted and because there was the USSR. So it was a global, a global fight. So in a sense, the real conversation we should have had would have been in 1990 or 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. In a sense, you, we should have this conversation between European and, and, and Americans saying, why? Why are you in, in, really, why do you stay? And we didn't have this conversation because of the Balkans, because of the Clinton administration, which was an internationalist administration. And after that, there was Afghanistan and 9-11. So, so maybe, actually, we are at the point that we have this conversation. And I do agree with what, what, Bob, really what Bob said. Actually, this conversation has not started with, with Donald Trump. It has started also with Barack Hussein Obama. You know, really, by the way, you know, basically, his restraint uh, in really to be polite in his policy towards Europe, you know. So that really, again, we are in a new we are in a, in a in a new world. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there, Tom. I'm going to give you a chance to jump in. I would note that this is the 70th anniversary of the Marshall, Marshall Plan, and that seems sort of relevant to the question of whether this is sort of the final end of that that post-war period that we're telling. And what do you, what do you think, Tom? Yeah, no, I, I don't really disagree with what the ambassador said. I mean, I do, I think, agree um, that geopolitical competition didn't really ever go away. It was that it was massively imbalanced in favor of Western countries. And that shift in the balance of power, I think, did result in a shift in behavior. I don't think it was necessarily inevitable. I mean, I do think that the individuals involved matter. I mean, if, if Medvedev had stayed president of Russia, there would be lots of problems between the U.S. and Russia. But I think the Russian behavior will be somewhat different. And I think if, if the Chinese leadership had turned out a little bit differently, that might be uh, somewhat uh, less tense um, as well. So I think all of these things um, are involved. But I do think that we are sort of at a critical point for whatever reason, however we got here, that the period we're in now is, I think, substantially different to the mid-2000s or the mid-1990s. And, you know, Bob... I guess I, you know, learned sort of this point from him. He probably expressed it much better than me. But the, but that period is really the aberration in, in international history. And so what we're seeing is the return of that normal system. The case I try to make in the book is that that normality will be very different and have lots of twists because it is taking place against the backdrop of global, globalization and interdependence. So we're not returning to the 19th century or the 18th century because we do live in the world that we created. And so this period of greater tension between the major powers will have lots of uniquely 21st century characteristics. And I think we aren't going to see maybe the prospect of a major war like we did in the past, uh, and thank heavens for that. Um, but there will be many, many ways in which those old impulses that we really are not used to I think, um, for, for quite some time, will come back into, in, into, into focus. Bob, is this, is this really a return? <laughs> <laughs> OK, a couple questions. Is this really a return to something like status quo ante when it comes to kind of regionally based great power competition? Is it sort of a restoration of regular order when it comes to the relative 
power of the United States uh, to these other powers? Or are we headed towards something that's, that's really substantially different in terms of international relations? Well, I think that when the United States became, started playing the role that it did play after World War II, which it did not play in the 50 years before that, mm -hmm. um, it, we really entered a, a historically unique situation. And it's unique, if, if only for geographical reasons. Um, it, it's very, it, no other power could play the role the United States has played just because it's a very powerful, rich country that is surrounded by relatively weak neighbors with all due respect to Canada and Mexico and, and two oceans. And therefore, uh, unlike other powers, it sort of broke what international relations theory would call the sort of um, uh, the rule of sort of strategic dilemmas and whatnot. It was actually able to become very powerful without immediately threatening its neighbors. And this gave it a tremendous capacity to actually project its power overseas and bring a sort of peaceful solution to regions that, uh, that, that were sort of in locked in a cycle of conflict without, in a way, threatening to take them over. It was very hard for a European power to bring a reasonable peace with its power because its very power created the danger for neighbors. So, so we're not, you know, if in that respect alone, we've entered a totally different territory and past models don't really cover it. So to my mind, the question is not, is really, is the United States continue to play that role or does it return to a role that is more like the role it played in the 20s and 30s, which is to have a more restricted view of its uh, purview and responsibilities and let the regions go back to whatever they're going to be. Now, I feel pretty confident that if Asia goes back to what Asia was, you really are back into, at the very least, a Chinese-Japanese syndrome, mm -hmm. which is likely, in my view, ultimately to lead to conflict in one way or another. It's much harder to predict where Europe goes if the U.S. pulls out, but I could imagine returning to some variation of what used to be called the German problem, mm -hmm. just because Germany, without any kind of American involvement, is sort of as it was, too big, too rich, too powerful for Europe and will create tensions, even if the Germans themselves don't want it, um, with their neighbors. But So I, I think that is the key question. I actually do not agree that America um, has lost sufficient relative power compared to Russia and China to be unable to play the role it's been playing just because its strategic geostrategic advantages are so enormous. Mm -hmm. China cannot become more powerful without threatening its neighbors who happen themselves to be very powerful. Mm -hmm. China's surrounded by great powers. There is no equivalent of Germany right now. Russia is a third-rate power, which doesn't mean it can't make a lot of trouble, but it's not about, as long as the United States is in the game, to sort of march across Europe. So I think the situation is manageable, but the real question is, are we willing to manage it, we Americans? And that's, unfortunately, that's the key issue. And my concern is that increasingly we are not willing, we don't understand why it's necessary, uh, and therefore we're kind of willing to let the world spin off in whatever direction it's going to spin off in. But that's a bad direction. Well, that goes back to, I think, my next two questions. One, which is, is that the part of this equation where who is in the White House matters, uh, and you know where you get back to agency as opposed to this, uh, the ambassador's point of view, which seems to be more that we're really looking at such macro trends that it's it's uh, maybe a variation of degree, but that in fact these are long-term strategic shifts in the world that are primarily fueled, uh, you know, by economics as well as uh, geopolitics, and therefore, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter so dramatically whether we're paying attention to Donald Trump's tweets today. So that's one question for you, is, is that where uh, American agency or, you know, sort of the, the, the great man or woman theory of things comes back into Tom's book? Uh. Well, I mean, obviously, history is an is a react is a interaction between individuals in important positions and larger trends. So, um, my view is if you had elected uh, Hillary Clinton or half a dozen other Republicans who were running, mm -hmm. it was more likely that instead of sort of going along with this trend that America has been on, they might push back on it a little bit. I mean, presidents do push back. 
Franklin Roosevelt didn't push back in his first term. He did push back in his second term against uh, an American attitude. So that was a possibility. So instead of having that, you have someone who's encouraging the trend even more than it is, which doesn't mean there can't be a backlash. But I do think we have to recognize and not kid ourselves that the American public has been moving in the direction pretty steadily. And I don't care what the polls say. Uh, you just have to look at the way Congress behaves. Congressmen think they know what the American people want, and they don't think the American people want more military spending, more global involvement, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a trend that would need to be arrested and reversed. And that would take very significant leadership, which now we're not going to have for the next four years. I want to probe into this uh, question embedded in the title, All Measures Short of War. How much, Ambassador Aro, do you uh, agree with the premise that uh, this new era will be characterized by very aggressive competition between states, but that it's not going to be a period of actual conflict between these powers? Do you think we're, we're at risk for something more than, than Tom has? You know, the, you know, if you had, uh, I think it was in, um, in January 1914, uh, January 1914, Sir Edward Gray, the, the Secretary of the Foreign Office in London, said that <coughs> really we have entered into a, a period of peace. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and nobody you know, could really think that the assassination of the, an obscure uh, our crown prince, with all due respect to Austria-Hungary, which is not represented here anymore, uh, nobody was believing that he could lead to a, a world war. So the problem usually is nobody wants war, or it's really rarely, uh, really, usually people don't want war, and suddenly they stumble into war. So, you know, you, if you look at the South China Sea, you know, you could think of an incident and, and, and so on. So, again, I, I, I agree, I do agree with, with Tom. Actually, I don't think that countries right now want war, uh, but incidents may, 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 may happen, you mm -hmm. know, but really it's... Uh, if, if I may ask, you know, really on, 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 in a sort of follow-up and based on this book, you know, really, um, I think we had nearly this discussion through, through Twitter with, with Tom when I was reading the book, I was sending my commands <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, to Tom and... Uh, and basically, I, and by the way, I was just browsing through Morgenthau, uh, the Morgenthau book, you know, Conflict Among Nations, uh, Politics Among Nations. And, uh, and Morgenthau so really says, and there are three types of, of powers. One is the status quo power. The second one is, in a sense, the revisionist power. And the third one is the imperialist power. Mm -hmm. So the difference between uh, the later, the two later, is that the first one is, doesn't want to destroy the world order, but wants simply to have a, a better, you know, really a better position in the order. And the last one, the, the, the third one, wants to destroy the order. And, and in a sense, you are speaking in your book only of revisionist power and status quo power. And it's not only a question of, of taxidermy, it's, it's really a substantial question. Because if you have a, a country in front of you, if he wants to destroy the, the power, the, the world order, really you have to have a, a containment policy. But if he simply considers that he wants to improve his situation, um, and what does it mean? What, what should you do? You know, really it's a, as you know, for instance, the British made the mistake of considering that basically Adolf Hitler wanted only uh, to improve his situation, why he wanted to destroy the, 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 uh, the, the order. But it leads to a different position. And, and frankly, when you are referring to the two main countries that you were referring to, Russia and China, uh, this question has some, really has a significance and may have actually consequence in the definition of policy. That is a much better way of phrasing the question. <laughs> you have to tell us the answer. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, the first thing on the all measures short of war uh, point, because I do just want to briefly address that. I mean, that phrase, one of its sources is FDR in the 30s who pursued all measures short of war against Germany and war happened. And it's also the title of a essay, a famous lecture by George Kennan in the Cold War, and obviously war almost happened in the Cold War. So I'm not saying that war will not happen. Um, and I'm sort of you know, conscious of it. Sir Edward Gray said that, but there was also this famous book just on the eve of World War I by Norman Angell saying war was impossible. Yeah. 
Um, so, you know, I, I was a little worried when Donald Trump started his North <laughs> Korea a adventures that the title may be discredited before it was even launched. But, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, war could happen inadvertently or through miscalculation. The point I was really trying to make, though, is that the primary strategic challenge we face is not so much avoiding great power war, which is always there in the background and I think is being worked on to prevent it. And I think everyone's conscious of that. It's really whether and how to engage in this competition on all these other dimensions that we don't have great answers to. Um, I agree as well, I think, with your characterization of the three different types. And I think that Russia and China both actually are not revolutionary imperialist powers in the sense that they have the capacity and ability to completely overturn the international order. I think they, their aims are more limited, um, but if they achieve their aims in the most uh, extreme form that they, that they have them, I think that will create a, a less hospitable world. That will create a more dangerous world. And the, if you look at um, China, for instance, you know, there are things at once that are perfectly legitimate. I think the international economic agenda that it has is perfectly legitimate. We may disagree on certain things, but actually it's a very reasonable disagreement, and they are perfectly entitled to pursue the things they're pursuing. And to its, to its west on the One Belt, One Road and Central Asia, you know, many of its interests are very compatible with those of the U.S. and with its neighbors. The question really is, uh, as it tries to assert its, uh, its uh, dominance over parts of East Asia, that that, is, as Bob said, bumps up against these other major countries and creates a less stable situation. And Russia, I think that it's different, but there's sort of a similar dynamic. So these may be limited objectives, um, but the case I'm making is that it's still worth competing strategically to try to preserve that more rules-based system because... You know, if you look at what both Russia and China want in Europe and East Asia, respectively, it is a sort of a more quasi-imperialist system, you know, in which mm -hmm. a lot of those smaller countries don't really have the voice that they have at the moment, that it's more mercantilist, less open. And I think it's worth thinking strategically about how to preserve some version of the status quo with necessary amendments and reforms, you know, to ensure that it continues to be uh, legitimate. So, Bob, do you do you share the view of Russia and China as revisionist powers, or do you think there's there's something more going on there? I think I share the view that they're revisionist powers, but I don't take any comfort from that. I mean, you could argue that um, that uh, Germany in 1914 was a revisionist power, not an imperialist power. I'm not sure the French really thought that distinction was important ultimately, mm -hmm. um, and uh, because whatever they whatever revision they were carrying out required the most disastrous and destructive war in history. So. It almost doesn't matter, and I do agree with Tom that were China to succeed in a limited goal of revising the security order in East Asia, whether that was their, you know, whatever their long-term goal was, the actual effect of that would be to destroy the international order as it currently exists and move us toward a, genu a more genuinely multipolar world, which I think will be inherently more dangerous than the present world. So it, do it doesn't really matter, and so the real challenge for us is to uh, somehow direct China in what we would call a more productive form of national aggrandizement, which takes economic form rather than military form. But that's going to be, that's going to be a major challenge, and I'm not sure we can succeed at it. And the only thing else, I mean, I would just, I, I, would, I would hesitate to say that nations uh, generally only stumble into war. I think mostly you get wars because ultimately a nation decides that they prefer war to the alternative. Uh, there's no question that Germany in 1914 preferred war to the alternative. Uh, and in that respect, they didn't, they want, no, they wanted to get what they wanted without war, but they were not willing to not get what they wanted, and so they were willing to go to war. And I don't think that's where China is right this second, but I could imagine China getting to that point um, at least I would. I would be. I think it would be foolish for us not to imagine China getting to that point and preparing to deter it under those circumstances. And a lot of it. I'm going to stop yammering now. But a lot of it has to do with what the sort of distant balancing power does. In the case of World War One, I, I believe that if Britain had made it very clear 
to uh, Wilhelm and the people around him that it was definitely coming into the war if they attacked Belgium and France. I think it's quite possible that Wilhelm would have not gone to war. He really was banking on the British not coming in. And therefore, I think it's very important, if the analogy holds, that the United States make it very clear that it will, in fact, come to the defense of those that, it, that might be threatened. And unfortunately, that is precisely the question that's being uh, raised right now by these actions and statements, or non-statements, as the case may be, of Donald Trump. So it does I, matter what's happening here right now. I want to be the devil's advocate, as usual, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm French. And, uh, you know, and actually, you know, very often I, I, I say, uh, really, I tell my young diplomats, put, uh, using a French a sentence, expression, put yourself in the, in the shoes of the other side. And, you know, really um, try to imagine if you had uh, Chinese uh, ships patrolling at 100 miles from the American coast. What would be the reaction of the Americans? There is something, you know, really, in the fact that, in a sense, the basic assumption is on this, that <coughs> the world role of the U.S. is legitimate. It's totally legitimate that, for instance, you know, you are patrolling on the, on the coast, not far from the coast of China. But if you are Chinese, you know, really, and if after one century of humiliation, you, you are becoming the second world power, and if you look at your borders and you see that most of your borders actually are really problematic in a way or in another, and uh, really, don't you think that really if you were a Chinese, you wouldn't more or less do the same, <laughs> trying to secure your sea lanes, for instance, you know, really? So it's, and as for the Russians, you know, really, we are a member of NATO, and NATO is the most great, greatest alliance in the world, and of course, it's defensive. You know, any alliance is defensive for the members and offensive for the non-members. Mm -hmm. You have to really try to imagine if, you had a, uh, if Mexico and the Central American countries were part of an alliance with Russia. If there was an headquarter in Mexico City, really, with a Russian general, and everybody saying to the, to the U.S., it's defensive, don't, don't worry. What would be the reaction of the U.S.? So in a sense, you know, in this new world of where basically, the, you're right, the, the U.S. will be the dominant power for the coming decades, really by far. But nevertheless, there is a, really a different balance of power which is less favorable to the U.S. and to the West. I think these questions, you know, really uh, have to be raised. You know, really saying uh, what the Chinese, you know, basically we are living in Asia, one, one of these very sensitive periods in the world, history of the world, which is an adjustment of power. Basically, China was a weak country and is becoming, in a few decades, one, the second world power. So well, well, what's, what's new, Mr. Ambassador? It, it, this, has been, this is what the whole history of the world is about. Yes, adjustment. The, the, the Ju justice, there is no justice in the international I, I system. Really? Uh, Germany in 1914 felt that it was being deprived, it mm. called itself a have-not nation and felt that it was being deprived of all kinds of advantages, including empire, which France had, uh, that it had somehow not been allowed to have. Uh, Germany in 1938 was trying to repair what clearly were, it, it regarded as wrongs committed in the Versailles Treaty that took German lands at French insistence away from Germany. You think the Germans didn't have, feel that they had a right to reoccupy their own territory in the Rhineland, okay? This, these, these kinds of uh, problems exist constantly, and the only thing you can do once you've realized that they have these beefs, which of course every nation in the world except the United States has a legitimate beef. Uh, I mean that seriously, <laughs> I mean that seriously. The United States has no legitimate beef with anybody, but everybody else in the world does. So having recognized that, what do you then do about it is the, the question. question. Is do you want to, shall, shall we hand China no. the East Asia that it feels it deserves? I, I never say that. I'm well, then what's the point of making the point you're making? No, really, I'm, make, I'm making the point, there is a point, first. <laughs> uh, I'm making the point that there is a point from a Chinese point of view. Of course. And after that, again, 
And the second point I'm making is, you can, of course, you, you know, you, you can let the situation, you know, really going to the, to the conflict. You can choose of contain, the containment saying to the Chinese, whatever you, you are going to lift the finger will be in front of you to prevent you from doing it. Or you, I'm asking the question, is it possible to manage it in, in an intelligent way? Because all the history of mankind, as you said, is adjustment of powers. The powers, there is no status quo. There is powers going up and going down. And at these very delicate moments, we have to find a management of the foreign relations so that it doesn't entail, it doesn't entail a war. It's simply the question that I'm asking. We have a major adjustment of power, a major one. You know, China was a very, very weak country in 1970, and now is the second world power. You know, really, so we know that it's, that's a delicate moment. And I was simply saying, how can we manage it intelligently? Okay, so ma moderator's prerogative. Really? We have uh, Mars and Venus here. Uh, so. <laughs> Bob, we'll, we'll come back to your, your book on this subject. <coughs> but I, I want to ask our author here to square the circle for us. Uh, you know, is this, in fact, a case study of what happens when the old order unravels and you have uh, people reevaluating first principles, right? You have now everything in effect up to be litigated, including the role that the United States should and should not play in this future world order. Yeah, it's great to be in the middle here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do think that, I mean, I think that China does have a legitimate Right, and I think in you know in the book I try to say it's not a question of right or wrong necessarily. I mean, the U.S. was a revisionist power in the past in the 19th century. Uh, revisionism comes in many forms. It can be good or bad depending on your um, perspective. And but the net effect of what they're trying to do, I think, does have negative consequences, you know, objectively for the world, you know, as a whole. So, for instance, uh, you know, if they do want to serve influence in East Asia. If that means, you know, no, that, tai that Taiwan, you know, it has to be forcibly incorporated into China, that's a pretty big deal. If Russian Serb influence in Europe means that Ukraine ceases to exist or the Baltic ceases to exist, that's of major consequence too. And so the question, I think, is how do you approach that? Do you try to accommodate it or do you push back? And the answer I would give is that you accommodate on those things that you think are pretty legitimate. And so to the extent that China wants a much greater say in the global economy, you know, that's a legitimate goal, or that they want a greater say in regional security architecture, if it continues to respect the sovereignty of nations, that's uh, fine too. But when it comes to the sovereignty of other countries or fundamental territorial issues, I think it's reasonable to push back, because if you don't push back in that context, then you essentially give a permission slip for future uh, behavior. And, you know, again, I think Bob has written about this more than I have in terms of influencing that debate. But there is a historical record that sort of suggests that when hardliners think they have, you know, an open goal, they push forward. And when they think that there's sort of a strong system in place to prevent that, they push back. We haven't really tested that a proposition yet, but I think it will be put to the test in the in the coming years. Bob, I want to bring everyone in with your own questions, but first, is this an old argument with Europe? Is this is this a is this a return to our debates of the past, or is this a reflection of the unraveling of the order and some kind of new geostrategic? No, this is an old argument. <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've had this argument a hundred times. Yeah. You, yes. <laughs> Every time I hear how brilliantly Europe has managed foreign policy and take care of, taken care of itself in the past, I'm always, I'm always amazed. Okay, but, <laughs> okay, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push you on this, though. You talked about China, but what about Russia and Europe? Uh, because I do think that is one where it seems that the consensus, to a certain extent on the panel, is that it's less clear in many ways than uh, trajectories we could imagine in China and in East Asia. Why is that, and, and do you think that war is, is less likely in Europe with Russia or not? It's, it's really, it's, it's hard to say because, again, this is, something that, uh, this is something that Putin would have to decide. I don't think, certainly the, West, the Western Europe and, and the United States are not going to look for a war with Russia, so he would have to decide how far uh, he would want to push it. Um, I actually think that Putin is in a very good position right now, that he doesn't need to do very much. The West, at least at the moment, is sufficiently divided and demoralized. Um, 
the new weapon that he has figured out how to deploy, which goes directly into election processes that either discredit the election or get the person that he wants elected, is something that I think he can play with for a long time. Ukraine is unsettled. He's made great gains in Syria, which I think he's not going to lose. Um, Italy is, I think, at risk of becoming uh, a, a different kind of state. He's got Hungary on his side. Poland is in a strange place, not on his side, but certainly not a, a good democracy now. So uh, Britain is behaving weirdly, um, uh, you know, and our, our hope now is the, is the Franco-German engine, which I do hope, it actually is the hope, and I'm, and I'm hopeful that uh, I know Gerard's going to play his role in, uh, in making that work. Um, and so, but I would say Putin doesn't need to do anything very aggressive right now to, to, to get what he wants, which is a divided and sort of hapless West, which is where we are at the moment. Tom, I'm going to put you on the spot again before we go to the audience. You spotlighted for us three challenges where you saw sort of this, uh, the broader questions raised in your book coming to play, the uh, question of Russia, China, and the unraveling Middle East, basically, uh, the rise of nationalism and versus sort of globalism, if you will, which is something we're seeing in our politics as well as in the politics of uh, partners in, in, in Western Europe and Eastern Europe. What are several other uh, known unknowns, if you will, uh, that you contemplated while writing this book? What are other flashpoints? I mean, let's all be real. Ten years ago, we didn't expect that we'd be sitting here talking about the sixth year of uh, civil war in Syria that has you know, sucked us all uh, into a, an unsolvable policy conflict. Uh, what are some other places that you feel uh, could be the testing ground for the theories of all measures short of war? Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, I think, I mean, I think the, the, so there's lots of things that aren't in the book, I think, because it's, it tries to be sort of a, a you know, a, a, a tight sort of argument for why we should sort of care about these dynamics. So clearly, you know, climate change, counterterrorism, uh, nuclear proliferation, I mean, North Korea is dealt with in the book, but sort of pretty, um, pretty briefly. I mean, those are all things that I think will often dominate the day to day of foreign policy. But the one I'm worried about is the one we sort of started with, which is, uh, you know, is U.S. policy, because I think you know there is. Even since I wrote it, there are there are um, signs that this president is, you know, calling into question fundamental pillars of. U.S. policy as it's existed for 70 years, and that, I think, will create new flashpoints. So I, I'm increasingly worried about the type of crises that we haven't seen for a very long time because there is an ambiguity or doubt about U.S. commitments that hasn't been there before. And I think that, to me, is the difference between President Obama and President Trump. I mean, Obama wanted to pull back a bit. He did want to retrench, I think, especially in the Middle East. Uh, he did see the burden-sharing thing as pretty important, but he never sort of you know, never really questioned the fundamental principles of the alliance commitments. He never suggested that he wanted to do away with the order proactively. Trump does. I think he's, he's limited by the fact that he doesn't have a team in place to do that. Very few people agree with him, even in his own cabinet. So I think there are real limits to what he can do. But the things he may choose not to do over the next few years, I think, could be pretty significant. So that's probably the thing I would worry about the most. Ambassador Rowe, are there examples of things that... Uh, if they were to come out of this administration, would, in your view, represent a really a revision on America's part of the world order, things that would concern you beyond the broader trend that we're seeing of, of America pulling back? Uh, you know, I'm ambassador, you know, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, uh, again, the, the problem is you have, again, as an, an outsider, you have a, a debate here in this city, an, an extreme of extreme tension, you know, really. And, and every word of the president, every tweet of the president and, uh, is immediately uh, discussed. And, uh, you know, uh, you have arguments around it. And uh, I think it's, we have not, and the president has been uh, there only for three or four months. So I guess that we have maybe uh, to wait uh, to try to see. Uh, whether how this transition is going, where this transition is going to lead. I think uh, you, you f people forget that 
any every transition is 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 difficult and long. You know, really it takes a few months. You know, people forget it every eight years. Uh, so maybe it's 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 a bit particular, but I think again, I I trust uh, the American system and. Uh, in the coming months, you know, we could have a normalization of the American foreign policy. Normalization, Bob? <laughs> I'm the ambassador. <laughs> I refer you to his previous writings. I, yeah. if, if I were ambassador, I'd be saying exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've got microphones. We've got microphones here. I'm, I'm hoping someone will be a better questioner than I have been. <laughs> Elicit uh, more, uh, more answers. We've got a microphone here. We'll, we'll take this and then this. Please identify yourself and try to make it a question when you do. I'm Tara McKelvey. I work for the BBC. And I have a question for you, maybe starting with the ambassador, about um, diplomacy in Washington. And if maybe there's lessons that you could draw from history that would help you understand how better to conduct diplomacy today and what you described as the Trump crisis in transatlantic relations. That was for you. Really? <laughs> I can narrow it if you want. I mean, anything about diplomacy. Well, what, what I'm supposed to say, you know, really. It's... Okay, fair enough. But we'll take another one. I'll answer it in a second. Yes, yeah, so we can take, yeah, a, yeah. You take a couple at a time and we can... Okay, sure. Yeah. Let's do that. I did call on you, sir, and then Dan. Uh, thank you. Uh, Christoph Scheuermann, Der Spiegel magazine uh, uh, in, from Germany. Um, how uh, should Europe deal with Donald Trump, um, with a president who takes a conscious decision to... Um, uh, not reaffirm his commitment to Article 5, um, uh, Susan, uh, with, uh, uh, who pulls out of the uh, Paris Agreement, um, is an overly firm handshake enough? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I can see the questioners I are can, tougher I than I start. was. So, uh, Tom, do you want to start then? Yeah, I can start with both. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's a big dilemma for, for all countries, particularly allies, is how to deal with this administration. I think what we've seen so far is a very sort of clear approach which is to engage. And, you know, I think there's, when, when countries sort of are really annoyed at you and, you know, but not deeply frightened, they tend to really let you know how they think. And, they're, you know, they would say in the Bush administration, you're a warmonger or shouldn't invade Iraq or, you know, with President Obama over certain things, countries may have been upset about Syria and they'd say that. But when they're really, really, really frightened, they tend to say, you're doing really great. You know, you're terrific. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, we like you. We want to engage. And that's sort of what's happening. You know, there's unprecedented anxiety, but everyone's been super nice because they feel like they're handling explosives uh, most of the time when they're, when they're dealing with the administration. And that's um, what we've seen, I think, particularly in Asia and the Middle East. European countries, I think, are finding it much more difficult because, you know, they, they are democracies. Yes, Japan and others are too, but there's elections in Europe. Uh, these are very divisive domestic political issues. And so I think it's a more normal approach, but it's one that has a huge downside, which is this president you know, does take things quite personally and, and does look at things in very minute ways, doesn't want to engage in the normal types of diplomacy. And the hope is that over time that trends towards you know, normal foreign policy. Uh, we don't know. My own take is that there's two you know, forces in this administration that are in tension and that tension will never be resolved. And the first is the uniqueness of the president. And the second is the fact that the vast majority of his cabinet are very mainstream and believe in a traditional foreign policy. And we're just going to see that play out. And how to handle that, I think, is, is, very, is very difficult. But that's the task, I think, that every sort of ally has. I, I think you have also to be fair which means really to look at Europe from the American point of view and to wonder whether Europeans can really take the, the high moral ground uh, when you see a Brexit, uh, when you see that really the populist outburst, the populist wave is sweeping, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, all really a large part of Europe, including France, even if the result of the election was, was what it was. 
you know, you have a lot of Europeans, a uh, strong, mi strong minority of Europeans, which are actually considering that what you, we call the liberal uh, uh, order actually is not a very good order because of the, they are anti-free trade. Uh, they, are, they want to get their country out of the European Union. Uh, so it's not, you know, really, again, uh, first, it's not one person. It's, it's a general crisis of the Western, uh, the Western societies. And I think it's part also of the redefinition of, of a world order. We have also to solve the problems of the Eurozone. We have to find, you know, really to define the future of the European, of the European Union. So the questions are not only at the doorstep of the American administration, but also at our doorstep. Okay, Dan, I promise to call on you and then we'll Uh, Daniel Dresner, Tufts University and Brookings, I guess, a non-resident fellow. Um, I guess one question for Bob and one question for Tom. The question for Bob is, I don't disagree with your point that each of the post-Cold War presidents started off campaigning on a more retrenchment platform, and yet all three of them changed dramatically once they were in office, in no small part because the international situation sort of dragged them either to Bosnia or in response to the war on terror or in response to the rise of ISIS and so on and so forth. My question is, what does an activist Donald Trump look like in foreign policy if there's an actual foreign policy problem that emerges and will he actually be able to handle it? Um, and then my question to Tom is, the background assumption it sounds like for your book is the assumption that we are going to have an open global economy and that we're so in interdependent going forward that that's not going to change. And I kept thinking about the in the run-up to World War I, factually that was correct, but you started seeing you know, state actors starting to take steps to ensure that if a war broke out, that they would have enough gold reserves, for example, to have run their currency and so on and so forth. So I guess my question is, what would be the canary in the coal mine kind of signals in terms of the global economic order to indicate that, in fact, we're going to have all measures including war going forward? Cheery questions, Bob? You know, I think that I agree, obviously, on, in the case of Clinton and uh, W. Bush, that they sort of came in saying one thing and then were pushed to another. I think it's a, the case is a little bit more complicated for Obama because he immediately did a kind of other reaction by increasing the troops in Afghanistan, albeit uh, in a limited way, or at least in a deliberately limited way. Uh, I think he did, uh, when he did Libya, I think he later decided that was the biggest mistake that he had made. And I would say that um, unlike most presidents, he was pretty firm all the way through the rest of his administration. And I think it's because he felt that he uh, had made a mistake in imagining that the American people wanted him to do those tougher things to sort of, in a traditional sense, prove that he was a tough president. I think he discovered that they actually didn't, or at least he didn't feel that they did. So we could have an argument about Obama. Um, and I guess what I would say, I, I, trying to predict what Donald Trump is going to do is a very uh, dubious uh, activity. But my general view of Trump is that, uh, which I think has been proven right, which is that he does not believe in world order and he does not believe in America's global responsibility, which to some extent all presidents had, in, including Obama. Therefore, he has a very narrow view of American foreign policy, which is going to benefit America in very narrow, direct ways. Um, that does not preclude the use of force, but it, pre it suggests that force will be used for very narrow, American-focused purposes. So I can imagine him responding to a terrorist threat with a, a, a very violent response, but not care what he leaves behind after he has schmeissed whoever needs to be schmeissed. That's an IR term for <laughs> people out there. Um, and, 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 you know, you kind of can imagine, like if, if, the, if America in the 1920s was also happened to be the world's superpower, what would it have done? And they sort of marry a country that says we're not interested in anybody else except ourselves, but we are very powerful and will use our power unilaterally. I mean, people got upset about George W.'s unilateralism. George W. didn't even begin to approach real unilateralism, which is something that we could, that, that's the only activism that I can imagine in, in Trump's uh, foreign policy. 
Yeah, in answer to Dan's question, um, I may not have uh, articulated this properly earlier, but I actually agree with that and, and talk about it in the book, that I think the fact that the global economy has been integrated creates these vulnerabilities, and in response to that, countries will, will disintegrate strategically in a targeted way to protect themselves against being exposed to their rivals. And so you will see, I think, countries taking steps unilaterally to ensure that they're not exposed on the sanctions side or in the cyber side or in many other areas. And then combined with the broader shifts in the global economy toward a more nationalist, mercantilist approach, I think we may be seeing some deglobalization. Now, globalization will, I think, continue uh, but it will just be shaped by strateg by strategic considerations. So its patterns will change, but will continue to be integrated. And I think it will continue to surprise us because as you know, countries take a look at this and figure out how they can manipulate it and use it, they'll come up with new ways to do so, and we won't be anticipating those. Uh, so I think this will be a constant you know, thing over the next 10 years or so. Okay, lots of hands up. Uh, I want to get somebody in the back there. Irina Rabidze, Bush School of Government and Public Service. My question was uh, towards Mr. Wright. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned the need for accommodation and you gave examples of how China could be accommodated, but I wanted you, you to elaborate what would Russia's accommodation look like uh, in practice? Thank you. <coughs> Yeah, I think that's a much tougher question, to be honest, because with China, you can identify areas where it has uh, overlapping interests with the U.S. and with Western powers. It wants a healthy global economy. It's very concerned about transnational challenges. But in Russia's case, um, they don't, I think, share the same view of the global economy because they, Putin has been trying to deglobalize pretty rapidly to have a more autonomous national economy because he doesn't want to be dependent on the global one. And to some degree, he sees you know, discord in the global economy as, a, as an equalizing effect. And so it's, you know, they're not, I think, in the game as much on that area. Um, there are obviously issues on, on you know, we saw on Iran, um, potentially on North Korea, although that's been a little less even maybe in terms of the Russian role uh, in that and a few other areas where I think there are common interests. But... I think it is hard to see a basic accommodation of Russia's interest in Europe because any uh, accommodation would really require a fundamental uh, downgrading of the role of the EU and of NATO, both of which are sort of unpalatable uh, for other reasons. So I think that the contrast there is, 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 is larger, although there are people coming up with ideas to try to square the circle on that, but I, I, I haven't seen one I agree with yet. Great. You, sir. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Sean O'Reilly, and I'm with Search for Common Ground. And my question is for Robert. Earlier, you alluded to that um, China may or may not choose to go into an adversarial relationship to gain some advantage. Um, given the interconnectedness of the economies of the world today, what do you think would be some of those issues that China may be willing to engage in an adversarial relationship, get, risking the relationships with the other world powers? Thank you. Go. Um, you know, I mean... The thing about economic interconnectedness is that it's really powerful um, until it isn't, and and then it isn't powerful at all. So you know, if you go back to prior to World War One, the interconnectedness of British and German economy and German and French economies they were you know very interconnected, and those were very important until other factors uh, took precedence. And those other factors are usually nationalism geopolitical competition, and often a combination of nationalism and geopolitical competition. Uh, there are theories also that if there's an, you know, if, if a country is suffering from an economic crisis, or in the case of China, some kind of legitimacy crisis, uh, maybe even a leadership crisis, which is not inconceivable, that um, this can tilt things in the direction of a more aggressive policy. I don't mean a policy that would say, let's go to war, but countries decide, it's, as I say, it's the question of, you know, can we tolerate not going to war? What are the risks if we do go to war? Do we think that we can get away with it? Do we think we can succeed, et cetera, et cetera? That kind of thing happened in Japan 
um, as, and, and led to war. And so those are the kinds of things that can happen. Internal, there's an existing situation which is a potential conflict, which is competition in the South China Sea and East China Sea. The question is what sets it off? And those things can be, as I say, entirely internal uh, to Chinese political economic situation. Okay, we're almost out of time. I want to take uh, one or two more questions. You, sir, and then you, ma'am. Thank you. Herb Rose, um, considering North Korea, what measures can you take to stop uh, what it's currently doing short of war? Let's get this uh, final question as well. Hi, I'm Laura Saarikoski from the Finnish newspaper Helsingin Sanomat. This is especially for Robert, but for the others as well. Do you have any new ideas about how the liberal democracy should handle terrorism? Because the old ones seem to breed populism. Okay, well, I feel like those are two pretty powerful questions. Maybe we can just go around uh, to everybody and finish up on that and anything else we want to... Um. Any question that begins, do you have any new ideas, makes me nervous because <laughs> I have a very limited number of ideas and very few of them are new. But, um, uh, you know, I think by and large, believe it or not, that we are doing a pretty good job of disrupting most kinds of terrorist attacks and the kinds of terrorist attacks that are occurring, I don't for the life of me know how we're supposed to entirely rid ourselves of them. I mean... If it's a weapon to have to drive a truck, uh, if people can pop out of a truck and start stabbing people, I mean, I don't know what, uh, I don't know exactly. All I could say is it's more intelligence, more penetration, uh, more education, more awareness by citizenry. Um, but other than that, I just, you know, I don't know what, uh, what can be done to completely eliminate the capacity of people to do such things, okay? Um, is, that's the question that was directed at me, right? Okay. Ambassador, do you want to weigh in on that or no, uh, on, North on Korea? No, on terrorism, it's, I think Bob is, is totally right. You know, really, um, when there were terrorist attacks in France, you know, people were saying, oh, it's because of security. the French are secularist. Uh, it's, working much, it's working much better in Britain. Uh, <laughs> so, unfortunately, it doesn't. Uh, so, I think that it's the usual... <laughs> Uh, law enforcement, international cooperation, and in this aspect, we I don't see what could be the role of NATO, to be frank. Uh, law enforcement, uh, uh, more education, more jobs, you know, really, I think we are engaged into a, a long-term, uh, a long-term uh, battle. <coughs> on the top of that, uh, considering Europe and the geography of Europe, of course, we are on the front line, because it's much easier to come back from Syria to Paris than to come back from Syria to to New York, and, and also we are also exposed, uh, vulnerable because of the migrations. Um, you know, um, people are speaking about the migrations uh, from the Middle East, but you have also potential migrations from Africa, you know, really. Uh, the population of this continent is, is really growing extremely quickly. So there will be also on the European side the question of managing the long-term uh, problem of, of, of migrations. Uh, so, no, again, we don't have new ideas, uh, and, but uh, there is something that we are sure is that we are engaged into a long-term, uh, uh, really a long-term fight. Okay, Tom, you get the last word, uh, and maybe a little bit on North Korea as well. Yeah, thank you, and, and, and thank you, by the way, to all, all of you for, for being in the panel today and learned a lot here and, and before um, that's really been informed the book. But... Let me just say a couple of quick words about the terrorism thing and then North Korea, because I agree with what the ambassador and Bob said on terrorism. But I would just add one thing, which is President Obama had this view that you could sort of narrow America's engagement with this problem, right, and sort of focus on ISIS, focus on a particular, the particular terrorist threat, and sort of disengage a little bit from the Middle East. And I think what we saw... Uh, was that all of these regions that we were talking about earlier are interlinked, right? And so no one really imagined that pulling back from Syria could result in a refugee crisis prompted by, you know, Assad's uh, uh, actions uh, largely in Syria that could almost collapse the European Union. 
but that you know almost happened. And the case I would make, it's not a new idea, but I do think that you know the outside in approach of having some sort of agenda for a regional equilibrium in the Middle East um, that sees a stable order there as a crucial part of the international system, I think is is pretty clear uh, now. And it's not possible to sort of disengage from that and just hope that it doesn't actually come back uh, to affect us. Now, quite to how to go about that, I think there's a lot of different you know, debates about how to do it because there are no real good options out there. So every option has a huge um, downside. But I think we can't get away from that. And so much of the debate on counterterrorism is on the very specifics of resources for this agency or that agency or intelligence sharing. And I think we've moved away from that regional equilibrium part. Um, on North Korea, um, I honestly don't really see it getting solved because I don't think there's anything that can be done uh, to the Kim Jong-un regime that is sufficient to cause him to fundamentally change his objective of pursuing ICBM capability with you know nuclear weapon that could be delivered against the US. Um, if you look at China, we've told ourselves this story that China is the crucial part of this and China has a solution, but the North Korean economy is actually doing quite a bit better than it was in the past. They went much, through much worse before, much worse than they could conceivably go through in the future, and they didn't change then. And so I think China could do more, but I don't see that if they did do more, that it would necessarily solve it, which leaves you with the military action or not. And there's really no solution to the proximity problem that you know, is caused by where Seoul is uh, located. So you know, there may be very targeted, limited military strikes um, that, that could be you know, part of the picture at a future point. But I think we're sort of drifting into this scenario where you know, that situation does get worse, and we have to figure out a way to essentially muddle through, and it will be worse than it is uh, at present. But I don't want to end on a totally pessimistic note. So I will just say that I do think that the, you know, one, the where I come out at the end of the book is to say that you know, these are essentially choices. I do think that you know, Western countries and democracies and, and, and emerging democracies, not in the West, that they, there is enough power there, enough options there to actually to be able to you know, achieve the objectives that if people want to achieve them of a more open, uh, stable, and prosperous order. I just think it requires a change in mindset and a change in policy uh, over the next decade or so. But I think that's very much uh, in our grasp. But thank you. I'm so glad to know that Tom's glass is half full. Uh, <laughs> and congratulations on the book. And thank you again to a fantastic panel with Bob. And